Okay, so there's a lot of news going on now, and um, I'm not going to be covering all these things in videos, so just I'll just do a quick roundup of some of the things I've been looking at. Um, in Australia, uh, a number of cities have um, that have been pink. Uh, the public buildings have lit up in pink to show support for breast cancer awareness. This is with the passing of Olivia Newton-John, um, of course, famous for her role as Sandra D in um, Sandy D in Greece, and of course, uh, a very successful music career as well. Um, by all accounts, she was a lovely lady and. Um, this is uh, what she passed away from. So it's sort of a mark of solidarity, um, not just for her, but for millions of women who go through this uh, and some men as well. So um, I thought that was a good gesture and a, a good tribute to her. Um, um, there, there's a lot of other stuff going on at the moment, uh, but rather uh, I'll, I'll move on to the main issue at hand um, because I could just get hung up talking about everything. Um, Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie has been attacked in New York City at a book event. Um, the info. This is breaking news. The information has just come through, but uh, apparently the the attacker was twenty four, um, and Rushdie may lose an eye. Uh, it's it's not fault that he's in um, his life is under threat. It seems he's in stable condition, but thirty three years later. You know, 33 years since the fatwa was issued against him. There's still there's still fanatics out there who, who want him dead. Now, I think it's fair to say Salman Rushdie may be the most high profile victim of Islamic extremism. But he's certainly by no means the only one. And, you know, almost 21 years after 9-11, I think the West is still, still, still not fully understanding or uh, appreciative of the of the threat that Islamic extremism poses. Now, I'm not suggesting, for example, in the United States, the mortality threat is the same as other causes like gun violence or road accidents or cancer or or any other sort of cause, but. I think this is just symbolic of the fact that Islamist values are incompatible with Western liberal values. They just are, such as plurality of opinion, such as diversity of faith. Um, I mean, uh, such as the hold that is Islamism has, uh, I think, infiltrated into the Western world. That when I was commenting on this on, on Facebook, I had to put a disclaimer. I had to put a disclaimer saying I'm not attacking um, Muslims, I'm attacking the ideology. Now I had to do this because I got censored um, last year because Lars Vilk, uh, a Swedish cartoonist who died in a car crash and who likewise had a fatwa issued against him and attracted Islamist rage, he, he passed away in a car crash and there were Islamists glorifying this, mocking this, celebrating this. Now his death wasn't a terrorist attack, but I, I thought it was rather reprehensible they were celebrating that. And I said so. And I um, was quite blunt in my thoughts on Islamic ideology. But because I said that, Facebook censored me, ostensibly on the grounds I was attack attacking um, people of faith. But I wasn't attacking Muslims, I was attacking Islamists. I appealed and I didn't manage to overturn that. So they censored me for whatever it was, two days. Um, but that gets into an issue of, you know, who's who's moderate, moderating Facebook and what, how are they reaching these decisions? But on the wider issue, you know, the West has, of course, went through some awful terrorist incidents and examples of intolerance that isn't just in the form of terrorism. I mean, we had in the UK, I know I've said this a number of times, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think it's a palpable example of this, which is the um, the fact that a teacher in Batley, near Leeds, um, had to live, had to 
go into police protection because there were death threats against him from Islamists, uh, angry that he had taught about blasphemy. Now, he was a religious studies teacher. It was his job. Interestingly, uh, those threatening him weren't necessarily Muslims in the area. They'd come from outside. Um, and there were some Muslim community leaders there who were trying to calm down tensions there to them. But there were others coming from outside. Now, at the time, neither Boris Johnson or Keir Starmer said a word about it. Now, what's the context of this? The context was, of course, the savage murder of uh, Samuel Paty in France, the teacher who was beheaded, beheaded by Islamists. France is a country that knows only too well the extent of this. France, arguably more than any other Western country, has faced the brunt of Islamist extremism. The United States, of course, 9-11 is a very big um, outlier because it was on such a big scale. Since 9-11, there's been Orlando, uh, San Bernardino, but of course, there's been many other attacks that weren't Islamist. Um, but I think Europe has definitely faced this. In the UK, we've had the numerous attacks in London, Manchester, um, in Germany, in Denmark, Denmark this year, Copenhagen, three people killed. Uh, in Spain, uh, the attack in Barcelona. Um, Turkey has suffered Islamist, Islamist attacks. And then, of course, th this, when we look at the sort of attacks elsewhere in the world, what Europe went through is dwarfed. I mean, Nigeria, probably more people have died in Nigeria from Islamist extremism than Europe as a whole. You know, the number of Christians who've been savagely murdered and people might say, well, it's worked both ways. There's been communal violence. Muslims have been killed as well. But the fact of the matter is, wherever you have an Islamic majority, the chances of this intolerance greatly increases. There's examples of uh, more of a moderate situation. Morocco, for example. Um, which recently recognised the um, importance of Jewish culture in Moroccan history. So that's an example of a more moderate stance. Um, Tunisia, but even countries that have long had a fairly moderate tradition, such as Indonesia and Bangladesh, have seen uh, and Malaysia have seen examples of Islamic extremism on the increase. Um, Turkey, of course has been presided over by the Islamist president and now prime minister, but really the de facto power in the country, talking about Erdogan, or, um, for over a decade now. So Erdogan incidentally, along with, I believe, the others was Imran Khan, um, Mahathir Mohammed of Malaysia. Those three uh, were demanding, demanding at UN level, um, blasphemy legislation at UN level. In other words, imposing this on non-Muslim countries. If this isn't Islamic supremacy, I don't know what is. But what is so troubling and reprehensible is the sheer cardus of those so-called liberals who appease this stuff and deny it. Because that would be Islamophobic. You know, while spray of women in Iran risk beatings and arrest to remove their hijab, you have Islamist women in the West who are promoting the narrative that the hijab equals freedom. Now, my stance on that is I, I'm not against women wearing what they want to wear. In point of fact, a neighbour of mine uh, wears a hijab and she's a very nice person. You know, so I, I've not been fundamentally against hijabi women. I want to be clear about that. What I'm saying, though, is this taps into the whole question of tolerance. If you're arguing that there should be solidarity for women who wear the hijab, what about the solidarity for women who don't? I mean, uh, there's a, a very poignant meme I came across. A lot of memes are brainless and stupid and evocative just for the sake of it. But there was one that was quite poignant, I thought, which showed two women, one with a hijab and one with um, without or removing her 
hijab, obviously, in Iran, or actually uh, she was an ex-Muslim. Um, and I think the, the caption read, um, I, I forget the precise wording now, but it was something along the lines of um, your stance um, makes me feel like a second-class citizen uh, versus your stance could have me killed. And that's not verbatim, but the point being was there is simply no comparison, no comparison between a Muslim in the West who might feel discriminated against, rightly or wrongly, um, versus a non-Muslim in an Islamic country or an ex-Muslim or an alleged apostate who could be killed, basically killed. Now, there are some examples of far-right extremism directed at Muslims. The big example of this, of course, is the Christchurch attack in New Zealand. There was also the Quebec City mosque attack. And there are some other outlying examples. But when we look at Europe, when we look at the actual, um, if you want to look at it in terms of statistics, over the past 20 years, the number of Europeans who've died from Islamist extremism far outweighs the number of Europeans who've died from far-right extremism. If you actually do the maths on it, and you look at the statistics, it's clear what's the bigger threat. And this is not to downplay far-right extremism. I know there's Anders Breivik types out there. I know there's some pretty nasty neo-Nazi groups out there. Let's tackle them. But I, I really have no respect for those, and I have to say they're predominantly on the political left, who will not acknowledge this problem. I mean, the CNN report on the Rush Day attack, not once in that report, and it was a good three, four minute report, not once did they mention the words Islamism or Jihad. They, they quoted the fact that Rushdie is a controversial figure, which is basically victim blaming as far as I'm concerned. Now, whatever people think of Salman Rushdie or his writings, I haven't read the Satanic Verses. I understand it's provocative. Um, Boris Johnson once famously said um, it shouldn't have got uh, the bullet or whatever the award was on purely literary grounds. Johnson didn't criticise the alleged blasphemy. But the French, I think, have got this right because they have said that religion cannot be above criticism. President Macron has clearly stated, and he attracted the ire of Islamists around the world for saying this, um, that there has to be the right to commit blasphemy. Now, when the likes of Erdogan and Imran Khan and other Islamist leaders, whether they're true Islamists or whether they're pandering to Islamists, it doesn't really matter. Um, the fact is they demand respect, but they don't show any respect in return. They don't respect the diversity of opinion in the West. They don't respect the plurality of opinion and the fact that we have freedom of speech. Islam is the only religion that has this problem to this extent. You can find intolerance in any religion, that's true. You can find intolerance in Christianity, um, in Hinduism, in Judaism, in Sikhism and Buddhism. You can find extremists in every faith. Of course you can. But I insist that Islam has a unique problem in terms of pan-Islamist extremism, in terms of this juxtaposition of a political agenda with violent intolerance. I mean, even if you want to compare uh, Christian fundamentalism in the Bible Belt, the United States, that's not even manifested in violence. Not to the same extent. So I do think this is a unique problem. I'm going to wrap this up soon. Um, but, you know, we, we look at issues like this, and as important as the Rushdie story is, we should remember that thousands of Nigerians have been killed, you know, and in countries like Pakistan, you have to walk very, very carefully because any perception of insulting Islam, you could get a lynch mob outside your house. Look at the case of Ajibibi. So we should take no lectures from a country like Pakistan when it comes to tolerance. No lectures at all. 
um, what Sunak proposed, I totally support. Of course, the likes of Five Pillars and other lobby groups will say it's Islamophobic. Well, I think Sunak's absolutely right to point out that this is a unique problem. And thereby extend it to, I mean, when he said that he wants to extend this to low to hate the UK, I think this is what he had in mind. Hate preachers. And then you get leftists like James O'Brien, who, you know, immediately get on their pedestal and, and say this is opportunism, it's populism and all the rest of it. But I think that's what Sunak was driving at. You know, you can't pretend that Islamic extremism is just, oh, well, it's comparable to other forms of extremism. I think this is a unique threat. I think far-right extremism, eco-extremism, all those things should be taken seriously. Of course they should. But I do believe this is a unique threat, and I don't think it's compatible with Western values. I really don't. Right, I'll wrap this up. Um, I hope I hope Rushdie recovers, and I hope it doesn't cost his eyesight. That would be awful. Um, I mean, for me personally, that's something that scares me. I think if, if I had a choice of parting with any of my senses, the last one I would choose is eyesight. That's terrifying to me. Terrifying. But it shows even in the United States, which hasn't had the same problem of Islamism, 9-11 aside, as Europe has, um, shows there's real hit out there. Very troubling. And we have to take this problem very, very seriously.